Once again, good morning to all of you. Uh, this, this morning's sermon is going to be a little different. Um, it's actually a two-part sermon, and so uh, during the first part of this morning's message, we're going to look at a passage from Luke and really about the elements of the Lord's Supper. So often we take the Lord's Supper and we read a passage from Scripture just right before we take the elements, but we don't really take the time to really soak in why we take the Lord's Supper, how important it is for the church, not only for First Baptist Church, but brothers and sisters in Christ worldwide. So uh, this morning, I'll focus on the elements, and then Pastor Lance will come up here and uh, talk about the, the, uh, the attitude of the heart when you take the Lord's Supper. So if you would, just uh, turn to Luke chapter 22, we'll be in verses 7 through 23, Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 23, and the, if there's one theme I want you to get out of this section of uh, our sermon this morning, it's this, that there is hope in remembering, that there is hope in remembering. So everything that we're going to go through, I, I kind of want you to just keep that in your mind. So often in life, we experience things that over time help build our hope and assurances for the future. And I'll give you some examples. So those of you who have children, or all of us have been children, right? Um, when a child scrapes his or her knee, for that child, it's horrible, right? I mean, you would think that the world was crumbling, that their leg got amputated, and they're just dragging it along, just reaching and crying for you. But as a parent, what do you do when that child comes to you in tears with a scraped knee? You comfort them. You love them. You help them through this little thing in our minds that they're going through, but it's really big in theirs. And so later down the road, something happens in that child's life, and who do they run to? They run to the parent. Why do they run to the parent? Because over and over and over again, you have reminded them that you're going to comfort them, that you're going to love them, that you're going to be there for them. Those of you with teenagers right now, it's, it's even more complicated, right? Because teenagers start experiencing all of these things in their lives that really are things that my generation or other generations never had to experience. And so they need someone to talk to. And if you've been that parent that comforted when the knee was scraped, that comforted when they flipped off their bicycle, they comforted in all these little things throughout their childhood, they're going to run to you and talk to you. Why? Because you reminded them that you love them and that you care for them and that you're going to comfort them, and they remember and have hope in that remembrance. You're going to be the one they run to. It's the way that God designed us, that repeated assurances in the past give us a more secure view of the future. And so by the time we get to our text in Luke chapter 22, Jesus is sitting with his disciples. They're getting ready to observe the Passover meal, and Jesus reminds the disciples that there's hope in remembering. So let's just read the first portion of this scripture. This is Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 14. Then the day of unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. Listen, he said to them. When you've entered the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters. Tell the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, Where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs. Make the preparations there. So they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Now, we got to understand that this, this uh, Lord's Supper that we remember, that we take to remember, was first happened here in the book of Luke. And what we have to remember is that this Passover meal had significant um, uh, correlations to the Jews during this time. And if, just to recall, um, if we look back at Exodus uh, chapter 12, we see that when the first Passover took place, what was going on. And so let me remind you of this. In the book of Exodus chapter 12, 
What we have here is Moses has been called to lead God's people out of Egypt, right? And so Moses doesn't feel up to the task, but he does it anyways after a lot of convincing. I think God was way too uh, kind and gracious with Moses, but he's way too kind and gracious with us, so it makes sense. And so Moses is called to lead the people out of Egypt and God to free his people and to make his name known among the Egyptians as the one true God sends ten plagues. Now the tenth plague was the one that was the last plague before they exited Egypt, and it was this. God said that what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill the firstborn in every family, people, and livestock. And he said, here's what I ask you to do. Here's what I call you to obedience to do. What you need to do is you need to go ahead and sacrifice a lamb, spotless lamb, one for your family. And you need to take the blood and you need to paint it over the doorpost and you need to cook the lamb and you need to eat it as a family and you need to make unleavened bread because you don't have time to let this bread rise. I'm going to call you to exit the, the land of Egypt immediately. So you make this unleavened bread, you eat the lamb, you eat the bread that night, for I'm going to call you out of Egypt. And he says, if you paint your doorposts with blood, that night when I come and I kill the firstborn of every family and of every livestock, I will pass over your home. That's why it's called the Passover. God spared the nation of Israel because of their obedience. And so here we have Jesus and his disciples observing the Passover meal, and they would have recalled what went on during that Passover in the book of Exodus. So we have to understand that the Passover was another example of God's reminder to his people that he keeps his promises. Just as the Passover meal reminded the Jews that God keeps his promises, the Lord's Supper reminds us of God as promise keeper. So you might want to ask yourself, well, what promises is, is God keeping? Well, remember, if we back it up in Genesis a ways, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. He promised Abraham an offspring. He, he promised Abraham that his offspring would be his people and that God would be their God. And Abraham didn't even have a son then. And they were old. God kept his promise and gave them Isaac. God reaffirms that covenant with Isaac later on, and God reaffirms that covenant with Jacob later on when he renames Jacob into Israel, and then we have the nation of Israel following that line. And now we get to Moses, and when Moses didn't want to go into Egypt because he was deathly afraid of what Pharaoh would do, God literally says in Exodus chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, I am the God of Abraham of Isaac, and of Jacob. God reminds Moses that he's a promise keeper. And that's what he reminds us when we take the Lord's Supper. The Passover meal reminded God's people that he keeps his promises, not because of anything that they've done, not their good deeds, not their wealth, not their notoriety, that he keeps his promises because of who he is. He's a promise-keeping God. And so they drank from the cup to remember the blood shed, the blood put on the doors, the Passover, so that God would see their faithfulness and pass over the home. They ate the unleavened bread to remember the swiftness of God's retribution against Egypt for enslaving his people and the immediacy of their freedom from slavery. We got to remember, church, that the meal helped the Israelites remember God keeping his promises in the past so that they would have hope for him keeping his promise to send the Messiah to save the world in the future. Because there's hope in remembering. Now in this moment in, in Luke, after we already find out about the Passover, the disciples eat this meal remembering God's promise of salvation in the presence of the Messiah, the Son of God. But the, the disciples didn't really fully understand what was going on during this. They were just living in a present hope and didn't even know it. 
But Jesus kind of flips this Passover meal on its head and talks about the specific elements, the cup and the bread. Now, in John uh, chapter 6, verses uh, 35 and then 47 through 58, Jesus actually brings this up to the uh, multitudes that were following him. He brings up two of the elements of the Passover feast. He brings up the two elements of the Lord's Supper. We have to remember that after he feeds the 5,000, the 5,000 think that he's a meal ticket. They're like, wow, I can get unlimited food from this guy. I need to follow him around. He's got a great message, but man, I'm full when I get finished listening to him. Let's follow him everywhere. And they follow him, and Jesus says to the crowds right after that, and this is starting in verse 35. He says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. That sounds pretty good if you're hungry and thirsty. But then he takes it up a notch. Starting with verse 47 in John chapter 6, he says, Truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then he goes on to say, truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day, because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And so here in our next portion in Luke, let's listen to what Jesus says to his disciples in his final moments with them during the Lord's Supper. Starting with verse uh, 19, we're going to skip a little ways down and go through 23. And he took the bread... Uh, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The unleavened bread that they have, he broke it, gave it to them, he said, this is my body. They would have remembered this conversation he had in John chapter 6 when all the multitudes left because they said, this word is hard, we can't take it, and only 12 remained, and those were his disciples. And then it says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Not the covenant he made with Abraham, not the covenant he made with Isaac or with Jacob, not the one that he reaffirmed in Moses, but this is a new covenant. No longer do they have to remember God passing over their homes. God was going to pass over the sins of the world through Jesus Christ. So in the same way, he took the cup and after supper he said, this is the cup this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And then he later says, but look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the son of man will go away as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And then it says, so they argued among themselves who was going to betray him. Church, we need to remember that the Lord's Supper anchors us in the assurance of our salvation. If Jesus says he's the bread of life, if he says that if you eat of me and that if you drink my blood, you'll have everlasting life, he's literally saying, place your faith and trust in me. I'm getting ready to shed my blood on the cross just as blood was spread on the doorposts of the homes. And that through my sacrifices, the spotless lamb, place your faith and trust in me and you'll have everlasting life. Just as the bread was broken and shared during the Passover feast, Jesus, the bread of life, was bruised for us to give us everlasting life to all who would believe in him as Lord and Savior. So when we take the bread and we take the cup, we remember God's promise of salvation because there's hope in remembering. We remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. We remember Jesus taking the full wrath of God for the sins of the world. We remember our sinfulness and our utter thankfulness for the grace and mercy of God. We remember that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 3.23. We remember Romans 6.23. 
that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We remember that our life before salvation serves but to remind us of the height and depth of the love of Christ. While our life after salvation serves to glorify and magnify the name of Jesus and the power of the gospel. If God has proven time and time again throughout scripture that he is a promise keeping God and he ultimately keeps his promises to his church through Jesus Christ, then when God tells us that when we give our uh, our lives to Christ, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, it's for all time because God doesn't break his promises. If we're told that Jesus is the final atoning sacrifice and there's no other sacrifices that we can make because God has said it and God keeps his promises. When we take the Lord's Supper, it assures us, it reminds us of our salvation. It cannot be snatched from us by the enemy. But then Jesus, during this time, not only reminds them of Exodus and and the first Passover meal, not only reminds them of what he's getting ready to do for them, but he also puts a little bit in here about what he will do in the future. Because remember, there's hope in remembering. So let's go back to the portion that I skipped. This is starting with verse 15. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's hinting at a future reunion. So he's reminding them of the past. They're anchored in the present. He's telling them what's going to happen, and then he's also pointing them toward the future. Church, because we remember God's grace, his mercy, his promise keeping, his salvation through Jesus, we can also have hope in the eternal and everlasting life with Jesus. One day, we're not going to have to deal with sickness. One day, we're not going to have to deal with natural disasters. One day we're not going to have to mourn the lives of the people that we've lost. Because one day we will be in the presence of the Lord and that will be all that matters. We are the bride of Christ, church. The church is the bride of Christ being prepared for her groom. And just as the Israelites observed the Passover meal the night before the Lord spared them, just as the the disciples observed, Observe this Passover meal with Jesus to remember God keeping his promise to save his people and to send the Messiah. Just as Jesus observed this meal knowing he was the fulfillment of all scripture, Jesus also gives us a glimpse into another meal that we're going to share with him. So I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 through 9 and let's read about this meal that Jesus is pointing us toward. Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. After this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous because he has judged the the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. A second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. A voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all his servants and the ones who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. You see, church, there's hope in remembering. 
When we take the Lord's Supper and as we take the cup and as we take the bread, we need to remember that the Lord's Supper reminds us of God as promise keeper. And no matter what's going, going on in your life, God keeps his promises. The Lord's Supper anchors us in the assurance of our salvation that as we take the bread and the cup, we remember that, that God has saved us once and for all. And finally, the Lord's Supper gives us hope of the wedding feast. One day, one day, we'll be in the presence of the Lord. One day we will fall at his feet and worship him. Every tribe, tongue, nation before him, praising him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that as, as we gather as a body of believers here at First Baptist Church, that we observe the Lord's Supper. And we thank you that as we take it, that we remember Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. That as we take it, we remember, God, that when you say it, you do it. That you never go back on your word. That as we see throughout Scripture, you are a promise-keeping God and you kept your promise to save the world through your son. As we take it, help us to remember that our salvation is secure if we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That the enemy cannot snatch it. And God, help us to remember that one day, one day, we'll be in your presence forevermore, worshiping you and giving you all the honor, praise, and glory you so richly deserve. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ron. If you'll now turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. While the instructions on Taking the Lord's Supper or seeing a couple of different places in Scripture. This is the clearest example that we have. Participation in this uh, ordinance uh, can become so commonplace that we forget to uh, place the reverence on it that it demands, that it not just suggests, but it actually demands. And uh, uh, perhaps another issue. Uh, that we're not very familiar with within this practice is that uh, it's done in different or different ways within different traditions. Uh, but we as Baptists try and get our instruction clearly and only from the Bible. And so here in 1 Corinthians is where we have that instruction as we go about this act of worship because that's what it is. Uh, it, we are remembering, but we're also using this to worship the Savior who died for our sins. And so I'm going to look through a couple of different passages here. I'm going to start with verses 17 through 22. These are the words of God written through the Apostle Paul for our edification and upbuilding. And he says, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better it is not for the better but for the worse for in the first place when you come together as a church i hear that there are divisions among you and i believe it in part for there must be factions in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized and when you come together it is not the lord's supper that you eat this is the first and only instance of uh, this being called the lord's supper in the bible for in eating it, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. And so prior to this section, Paul has commended the church in Corinth for several different things, but he comes to this particular discussion on 
the Lord's Supper, and he says, I cannot commend the church for your practice and for your worship in this action. He is saying on this subject, I actually have criticism. And on this subject, some of them are going to be uncomfortable. And as we talk here this morning, some of us will probably be uncomfortable. Because within this group of verses, God is going to offer four different comments. He's going to offer instruction about how to remember the Lord's Supper. And we will read those as we take it for ourselves at the, the end of the service. He's going to give a command about the Lord's Supper. He's going to give encouragement about the Lord's Supper. And here in our opening passage, God is offering a warning about taking the Lord's Supper. And we are warned specifically about taking the Lord's Supper with division in our heart. We think about what this act of worship is remembering, and it is remembering the sacrifice of Christ where even on the cross... He prays to the Father and asks that the Father would forgive the people who have actually placed him on the cross and is the very picture of the gospel. And if we draw our attention to this fact, the fact that he was praying for those who were hurting him, who were in the process of killing him while he was being crucified, we understand how dangerous it is for us to have division within our own heart as we take the Lord's Supper. These things are not compatible. If we look at this with division, we look at it with selfishness, not love and not humility and certainly not the grace that God showed us on the cross. And I'm not saying that if there is any division in the church, then the church shouldn't take communion at all. What we're going to see this morning is that the Lord's instructions through Paul are focused on the individual heart. So the question isn't, is there division in the church? The question is, is there any division in me? Before we even get to the Passover meal, the meal that Jesus is sharing with his disciple, Jesus reminds us of the destructive force of a divisive heart. He tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. This gift is something beyond the normal tithe. This is, gift is from the obedient person in the church. This gift is from the cheerful giver within the church. But the gift to God will not be received if there is any anger in the person's heart towards one of God's children. And that is who we are divided with. Everyone that we have conflict with, they are a child of God, a child that God loves. We cannot have communion with God if we have division with God's children. There was a division among the pious and the free-spirited within the church. We see that in verse 19. Another major division described in verses 20 to 21 was between the rich and the poor. If we go back several chapters in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this describes a division over those in the congregation who thought who, that someone was a better teacher or who they had been baptized by. This might be the first example of a celebrity culture within the church. You're starting to talk about the the person that you sat under to learn or the person who actually baptized you. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, describes division caused by jealousy. Not exactly sure what that jealousy was over, but I imagine it is some of the things, same things that we experience in the church today, some of our sources of envy. And all of this, it does not matter what it is, all of it is displeasing to God. It is not something that should exist within the church, but it certainly does exist and should not exist, especially around the Lord's table. If this type of division exists in our heart, if we are in open conflict, whether we have used words or physicality, or if it's just something that, that we're holding against somebody, then we leave the gift at the altar. We reconcile with our brother. We leave the bread and the cup at the table. We go and unite with that person. 
And if they don't want unification, we don't just say, well, I've done my part. I've tried. There's nothing else I can do. That's not the picture of the gospel. We continue in our effort. We continue in humble obedience. We try again and we try again and we try again because we do not want to be separated from God's children. But often this doesn't happen. We don't realize we need this until we look at our own life and we look at our own heart. This is what Paul encourages all of us to do before we take the Lord's Supper. He says in verses 27 through 30, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died starts off with a warning, a warning that we will be guilty before God. We don't often think about that as we participate in communion, as we are remembering the sacrifice of Christ. We don't think about the fact that if we're doing this in an unworthy manner, that we will actually be guilty before God. But he encourages how, us how we can avoid that guilt by examining ourselves, he says, and then taking the bread and taking the cup. So we are encouraged to take the Lord's Supper, Supper after a period of self-reflection. I'll pause right here for a moment because this is a specific point of correction that is offered and is something that I need to focus on for all of us. And I say this because I know some of us, this is going to, we're going to miss the actual point here. There was a guy that I played football in high school with, and he was notorious for skipping school. And uh, he actually became a very big part of our team my senior year. He was, a, he was a senior as well. And one time he actually got caught skipping school, and so he was suspended. And so he actually missed one of our big games that Friday. And so the coaches did the, uh, I don't know if any of y'all experienced this, they did the thing where they bring the whole team together and they make him stand up in front of the team and make him apologize to the team. You know, it's not just, you know, I've, I've done this and, and I've let myself down, but I've also let the team down. You know, he, he does all of that. And, and uh, it's kind of making an example, I guess you would, you would say. And so we do that after practice and then we go into the locker room and his locker was just a, a couple down from mine. And I saw, uh, I listened to him uh, speaking to one of his, his friends, one of his good friends on the team. And he just says, well, I'll, I'll never do that again. And uh, his friend said, what, skip school? And he said, no, I'm still skipping school. I just won't use the, the student lot. Uh, there's too many teachers there. I'll, I'll go out the other direct. That's not the lesson that, that was intended to be learned there. And so as we, as we read this, I want this to be, to be very clear. There's a specific lesson to be learned here. It's like the story, and, and a, a, perhaps a better illustration would be Luke chapter 18. This is Jesus telling a story. It said, two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this. He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In this period of self-reflection that Paul is commanding, the Lord is commanding on us through Paul, we are to reflect on one person's sins. Hours. It's about correcting one person's relationship with God. Ours. At the institution of the Lord's Supper, Judas, or Jesus let Judas share in that worship. He offered a time of self-reflection, and Judas did not take it. But Jesus did not refrain from letting him take the Lord's Supper. He didn't withhold it. 
he would fall, Judas would fall into the category of the one who was guilty concerning the body and blood that Paul's talking about in verse 27. And like the passage says in verse 30, Judas paid with his life. But this is a time of personal reflection. If we're thinking about other people and what they're doing, that should be a matter of repentance for us. Because we are more concerned about somebody else than we are about the body and the blood of Christ. We need to learn the right lesson from what Paul is saying here. Where is our sin? Where is our struggle? We have no problem pointing out what other people are doing wrong. That is very, very easy for us. But that has no place as we prepare to take communion. This is a time of self-reflection only, repentance, and acceptance of the forgiveness that God gives us, knowing that we need it. Not in an abstract way, not in a, oh yeah, I sin, everybody sins, nobody's perfect. But in a specific way, searching our heart, searching our life. Where is my pride? Where is my rebellion against God? as I prepare to take the body and the blood, realizing that it was me who put Jesus on the cross, not everybody else in the church, me. The last part that we have here, I'm actually going to go ahead and read through verse 34, starting in verse 31. It says, but if we judge ourselves truly, meaning that if we went through a proper time of self-reflection and repentance, we would not be judged But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give direction when I come. So all of these things here are contrary to human nature. They're contrary to our society and societal norms. Judging others is what we're used to. Recognizing our own wrongs is not what we're used to. Accepting discipline from others, even from God, is not something that we are used to. Treating others as more important than ourselves is not something that is common. We don't want to do any of these things, and that's why the instruction concerning them within the Lord's Supper is so important. It's not an ordinary part of our life, but it has to be special to us. It requires a focused attention. We're commanded to take the Lord's Supper with reverent focus to keep our attention on God. If you've followed the acting career of of Kevin Costner, I know he's getting a little bit older now, but um, he is a huge fan of baseball. That's one of his his favorite sports. He's done a lot of of baseball movies through the years. It's actually some of his his most recognized uh, work that he's done. And in the late 90s, early 2000s, he did one um, called For Love of the Game. Uh, and it's kind of, he's an aging pitcher for the, I think he played for the Tigers and, and uh, just follows his last game. And, and through that game, he does like a flashback of his, his whole career and, and things like this. And one of the things that he does is he'll, at the, at the beginning of each inning, he gets up on the mound and he, he uses this phrase, he says, clear the mechanism. And what that does is it, it takes all of the, the noise and all the fans and everything and just sort of shuts them out. And it's just him and the batter and the catcher. And he's able to, to block out all that destruction and, or distraction. And so our pitching coach in college, uh, he, he showed us that clip. And he's like, have, have any of y'all ever seen that before? Have any, and we're like, we're, we're baseball playing college kids. We have nothing to do but watch movies. We've seen it like 10 times. But, uh, but he was showing it to, to, to get us to understand blocking out distraction, being focused in on what we're doing. And this should be a, a regular part of our worship, but it should, as we come before the Lord's table, it should, should certainly be a part of that. And even as an act of worship, we recognize we live in a fallen world and there will be distraction. There will be things that we think about. And this becomes even more dangerous as worship becomes commonplace. This is something that we've done over and over and over again. This is something we've done since we were children. And now maybe we are very old. So how do we focus on that? 
when you're driving to work, it's become, especially if you work somewhere a long time, it can become so commonplace that you can multitask doing a lot of, a lot of different things and still make it to work safely. But if you're driving through a bad storm, then a lot of times you're going to turn the radio off. You're going to tell the kids to hush. You're going to focus on, on what you're actually doing because there's a need to focus. When you're, when you're at home and you walk in, you, you sit down, if you, have a, if you have a pet, if you have a, a dog or you're unsaved and you have a cat and they come up and, and stand beside you, you can, you can pet them without really paying attention to it. But if you're, if you're like the South End teachers were the other week and you're holding a 12-foot snake, you're going to know where that thing's mouth is at all times. You're going to be very, very focused on it. There's times where, where even, even though distractions are possible, it requires a, a focus, a reverent focus. And this is what it means to come before the Lord's table. I pray that we can do that, not thinking of other people and their sinfulness, but focusing on our need for repentance. We're going to share in this together. Now I'm going to ask the deacons if they're going to if they'll come forward I'm going to ask the worship team if they'll come forward I hope that we have already been reflecting but this is the time for us to do that as we listen to the music and as we pray together and as we read the scripture as we remember the full sacrifice of Christ thinking about what the Lord's done for us. The Lord's Supper was the first meal that was shared with the disciples before the betrayal of Jesus. As Ryan mentioned, they were sharing the Passover meal. It's first instituted in Egypt, a spotless lamb. The blood was spread over the doorpost and the lintel of the house. But from the moment of the institution of the Last Supper, from the moment of the crucifixion, Jesus is now that spotless lamb without any type of blemish, without any type of sin. And because of that, he has set us free. So let us reflect on that as we share in the Lord's Supper together.